Hello everyone and welcome to Small Screen Maniac. I'm Constance Miller. In this episode, we're going to talk about spoilers about the first two episodes of X-Men 97. So, if you don't want to know anything, turn back now, but come back and watch it after you watch the show, and then you can see how your opinions coincide with mine. So, I'm going to kind of break this down character by character, and we're going to begin with Cyclops. Cyclops is such an improvement over the first run of this animated series. He's a lot more badass, he's a lot more action-oriented, and he's still basically that leader of the X-Men. And that's something that he doesn't really want to give up. And it's very interesting. He's definitely hard-headed. Um, very by the book, which is how he should be, um, but also slightly sarcastic and, and cocky, which I really loved. And there's this moment that is just stellar, and it's, um, the X-Jet is destroyed in the air, and everybody's scrambling, those who can fly, to get the one you can't, and Cyclops is just like, boom. I'm diving down, and then he uses his optic blast to slow his descent so he can land safely. It was epic, it was amazing, and I loved that. Loved it. Moving on to Beast, he doesn't have a lot to do in these two episodes, but he's still the same lovable Beast from the original series, and that's was a great form of nostalgia. It was great to hear George Buza back as the voice of Beast, and I, yeah, it was great. And he was realized, executed so well. Uh, he did get some, uh, some couple of really neat action sequences. So yeah, the action in the show is pretty intense, and I like it. Now it is time to move on to Wolverine, and surprisingly enough, um, he doesn't have really a whole lot to do in these two episodes. His character is definitely the same, um, and the same voice actor, Cal Dodd, and that was nostalgia in and of itself. Um, I think one of the uh, best moments he had was when he was panicking on trying to get Jean to the hospital. Um, and there was, yeah, that was, that was kind of funny and hilarious, so that was really cool. Storm, oh my gosh, what an improvement has been made to this character, and her power set is so much more amazing in this show, and and Allison Zeely Smith returns as the voice, and I was wondering if they were gonna do those kind of cheesy, um, I am lightning kind of thing, and they do. Um, I thought that they would get rid of that kind of ridiculousness, but it's there and it's executed very well. It doesn't seem nearly as corny and it's just, it's amplified by the animation, what they do with her powers. And sadly enough, um, she's stripped of her powers at the end of the second episode. And that ties into a storyline from the comics. It was executed a little bit differently, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Now on to my favorite character of all time, Jean Grey. 
She is quite pregnant at the start of the show and um, definitely remains the heart of the team. And she kind of is trying to pressure Scott into leaving the X-Men so they can raise their family. And she has a, uh, this really awesome sequence uh, where she's using Cerebro and she gets onto the astral plane and some weird stuff happens and we don't know really what it's all about and and then she goes into labor yes so she gives birth to nathan charles summers um they got rid of the second middle name christopher based on cyclops's dad's real name um i i thought that was a little bit odd, but um, all is well with Baby and um, at the end of the second episode there's a the knock at the door and another Jean shows up, dis distraught and needing the help of the X-Men and the Jean that we know is kind of got this look of uh oh, I've been found out or what the hell is this? So, as many of you already know, the Inferno storyline from the comics is going to be adapted, which involves a clone of Jean Grey named Madeline Pryor. So, has Madeline been posing as Jean during these two episodes? And if so, when did she get replaced? And is, or is this Madeline that's showing up needing the help of the X-Men? Um, which I kind of hope it goes that way. Uh, I think the next episode is really going to dive into that and we'll see where it goes. Up next we have Julie and she is voiced by a different uh, actor, Holly Chow. Um, and it's weird because she sounds so similar to the previous voice actor, Allison Court. Um, it's almost hard to tell the difference. Um, but Jubilee is definitely a bit more evolved in the series. She's not the, the whiny baby kind of character that she was. You can tell she's got some more experience and, um... They didn't, haven't really brought her out onto the field a whole lot, so we haven't really been able to see her unleash her powers a heck of a whole lot. Um, there was a nightclub scene where she's dancing and using her powers at the same time. That was pretty cool. But yeah, yeah, I think definitely an upgrade for Jubilee there. Now we're moving on to Magneto, and wow. Um... He is now taking over the school based on Charles Xavier's Last Will and Testament. He controls the finances, he's in charge of the X-Men, he owns the mansion, and this throws the team into a huge frenzy because they d don't want to trust him. But it turns out that Magneto wants to atone for all his past crimes, and that's what his mission is, and that's his story arc, and it's nice to see him interact with the other X-Men a lot more, because he's pretty much just been Xavier's friend and nemesis, frenemy if you will. So, he hasn't had much interaction with the other team members, so... <coughs> oh, excuse me. So, that's been interesting. Morph. Morph had some really, really cool moments as far as his shape-shifting abilities into different characters. Uh, you see him morph into Archangel, 
Blob, Colossus, Lady Deathstrike, Psylocke, um, really kind of cool, and, uh, he doesn't really, oh, and Professor X, he does that too. Um, you don't get to see, um, uh, a whole lot of Mort himself, and with all this backlash about him being non-binary, there's only one indication of that thus far, and that's in the end credit sequence in his description that shows up. Um, by mentioning, um, the pronoun there. Um, but I, and during the opening credit sequence, his little title card, uh, also involves Mr. Sinister. Oh, uh, so that was a nice little throwback and I think an indication of things to come. So Bishop. Bishop is in his past, um, if it's his past, and it's not really explained why. Um, I think he mentioned something about his future, but it was fast and fleeting. However, his action set were amazing, and how they show his power to absorb energy and redirect it was done magnificently. And yeah, I, I think a certain improvement over how he's been interpreted in the original series. Um, so I hope there's more to come with him. The Executioner, um, he is a member of the Friends of Humanity, the anti-mutant group, and he's kind of the leader, and the Friends of Humanity have, uh, obtained a lot of Sentinel tech, so that makes them a little bit more powerful and a deadly force to reckon with. And he's the one that designs the, the weapon that he initially was going to hit Magneto with, so he could depower Magneto. So, but instead, Storm jumped in the way, and she got hit with the ray gun and lost her powers because of it. And uh, that was so touching. Uh, as far as, like, how how she couldn't feel her connection to nature and how devastating that was to her. They did that very well. Um, it's hard to say whether Executioner is going to be a one-off villain. Um, I, I think he served his purpose and... I don't really see much more of a need for him since there's still so much that has to be explored and explained in the next eight episodes. Now we're moving on to Rogue and it's so great to have Lenore Zan back as her voice. I love it. It's just so iconic and not to say the other voice actors for Rogue in other series were bad, but you you just gotta love Lenore. And I didn't find Rogue to be as spunky in these two episodes as she usually is, but there's more going on with her than just her not being able to control her powers. She's definitely bonded more with Gambit. And we see that Rogue uses her powers to absorb the medical knowledge from the doctor who would not deliver Jean's baby, or Maddie, depending who that is. So Rogue is the one that delivers the baby. And that was kind of really cool. And then we see glimpses of Rogue's past with Magneto. And the fact that they can touch each other, skin to skin. Well, I think there's an electromagnetic field around Magneto's skin, but it's the closest thing that she's ever come to. And I love 
that. That was such a great touch. It was great. So now we're coming on to Gambit. And Gambit is extraordinarily sexy in this show. Um, and he kind of flaunts it. And I thought that was really nice. Uh, the voice actor is not the same. Um, A.J. Lacasio, I believe, is the new voice of Gambit, and he also sounds a lot like Chris Potter, the former voice. And he's charming, and he's definitely more of a badass in this show. Uh, the iconic scene of uh, Gambit charging Wolverine's claws is already iconic. And it's interesting to see how this little love triangle with Rogue, Gambit, and Magneto is going to take place. Because Gambit is sensing there is something there. Oh, it gives me chills. That leaves us with Sunspots. The new character that has been abducted by the Friends of Humanity and rescued by the X-Men. So he's sort of like the new Jubilee. Um, to where we get to see what the X-Men and Xavier School is like through his eyes. And he's very reluctant. And it's, it's nice because... They talk about his wealthy family. Um, and I think it's a good introduction to this character for this show. He's been adapted before and it hasn't really clicked. Um, but so far this is clicking and it'll be interesting to see what they do with Sunspot. Overall, I had such a great time watching these two episodes. I'm dying for the next one. Um, I really don't have anything too critical to say uh, as far as anything I didn't like. Uh, I thought the animation looked great. Uh, the action sequences were stellar. I think the characterizations were spot on and it was great to not to have to worry about all the backstory. Um, I thought that they were going to do a lot of exposition in these first two episodes which really worried me because the season is only 10 episodes long. So my only worry is that they're going to cram so much into these episodes that we don't get to fully flesh out what happens. Um, and I think the only other major thing that really is going to transpire is the Infernal storyline. Um, there's going to be more to do with Valerie Cooper. And... Obviously, Mr. Sinister is going to be thrown into the mix. Uh, he has a lot to do with Madeline Pryor. Um, it'll be interesting to see how that affects Morph. And as far as other characters that are supposed to be introduced, um, I know Emma Frost and Sebastian Shaw are supposed to show up. Um... And then we gotta throw Nightcrawler in there. So yeah, there's gonna be a lot that's gonna have to happen in these next eight episodes. So I hope that they do it justice and I'm excited to see the rest of it. Um, the use of the theme song and the opening credit sequence being nearly identical to the original uh, was a nice touch. Um, and throwing in the slight differences, uh, here and there were super awesome. So, share your thoughts down below as far as what you think about the first two episodes of X-Men 97. I'll definitely be excited to hear what you have to say. 
uh, see if maybe you can enlighten me a little bit on things that I might have missed or didn't comment on. And yeah, don't forget to hit like and subscribe. And hit that notification bell if you want to be notified anytime that we upload a video. I will definitely be going over future episodes. And as always, love and light to you all. Do 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 do